and these three guys who would wear these fancy clothes who came from a faraway land to worship Christ. But now as an adult, I'm thinking more and more about why is this story, why are these characters in the Bible? Like really, what is their importance? Is it simply because God wanted us to have these nativity plays? He wanted us to to understand that there were more people involved in this story, that there were shepherds and these magi. And so as I, I, I studied this and as I dove into this understanding of the magi, I've realized at least when it comes to the way Matthew tells it in his gospel, that these magi, as well as King Herod, show us two different responses that we have to Christmas, that we have to the birth of Christ the coming of Christ. And again, we are continuing our sermon series on the Advent. And the Advent is specifically a time in which we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at how the Magi prepared for the coming of Christ. And so would you please open up your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter uh, chapter 2. And we're going to start reading from verse 1. And as you open up your Bibles, I want to make something very clear. These magi were most likely from Persia or from Babylon. These magi were from the east and they were from modern day Iran. Uh, They were from this place, this foreign land, and they had these foreign gods. They were these people from a distant place. And the reason why we call them magi, the reason why we call them wise men, is because they were educated. Not everyone during this time, during uh, this era, had the opportunity to public schooling. It was only the, the rich, it was only the wealthy that were able to really set aside a time to go to school. And so these were the guys that had the resources, their families had the resources to send them to school to learn about things like the stars in the sky and how the heavenly bodies moved around. And I'm sure it was fascinating for them. But we have to remember, these are foreigners. These aren't Hebrews. These aren't the Israelites. These are men who were from a different land. So let's read starting from verse 1 of chapter 2 in Matthew. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For you, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people." When Herod summoned the wise men secretly, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And when he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word. Remember, this is Herod speaking. That I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. All right, so this is the story of the Magi as told by Matthew. And what I love so much about this story, what, I, what I, I'm learning to appreciate about this story is that from the get-go of the New Testament, from even the, the Old Testament, but especially from the get-go of the, Old Te- of the New Testament, God is making a clear and apparent statement that his people, the people that he chooses, that he wants to get to know him and to love him, isn't just this 
special group of people in Israel, but that God is revealing himself and showing himself to people of a foreign land. That it's about the Gentiles as well as the Jews. That it's not only about having an idea of the Jewish people are the chosen people, and of course they are, but God is interweaving and he's using these different people of different nationalities to bring about the truth, to usher in Christ. And so as I look at this story, I'm amazed to see their reactions. And the way this story goes is fascinating to me because when you kind of break it down, because this is a short passage talking about these men, these magi, these wise men, but when you start unpacking it, you realize that there's a lot more depth to it. There's a lot more substance to it that it's not just about three guys in a nativity scene, that these men were real men. They were real people. And let's, let's kind of go in their perspective for a moment. You're, you're someone who's living in Babylon, who's living in Persia, in modern-day Iran, and you, be, you begin to go to school, you begin to go to college, you begin to go to grad school, and your, your concentration is astronomy. Your, your, your job every day when you wake up and when you go to sleep is to think about the stars. And that's your specialty. That's your major in college. And these aren't the guys that chose astronomy because it's an easy major. They chose it because it's the most fascinating major. And these guys are in their room studying together and they notice, hey, that star over there, that heavenly body, that's not supposed to be there. That's never been there before. And, and mind you, they're in Babylon right now. And they're looking at it and they're saying, it's not moving the way the other stars in the sky are. It's not moving the way the other lights and the other, wait, why is it just hovering over one specific place? And they do their calculations, they do their math, and they figure out, why is it hovering over Israel? Why is it hovering over this specific country? And so being the good students they are, they go into the text of the land. They find an Old Testament. They find the Holy Torah. They find the, the books of the prophets and the minor prophets. They gather all together and they begin to read all the prophecies that, that, that Israel has placed on them from God. And mind you, not their God. So from their perspective, it's the prophecies of a pagan God, of someone from another land, another region, but they begin to read and they say, wow, this star in the sky is a representation of this God named Yahweh, this God who's called the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is fascinating. This is incredible. And as they read the prophecies, they realize that it's been prophesied that a child will be born, that a child will be born in this city of Bethlehem. And so when they approach King Herod, they take this long journey and they go to the capital city of Jerusalem and they meet with King Herod. And King Herod, we have to mind you, he's not like the normal king. He's kind of like a mayor, like a glorified mayor of the, of the region of the land because even during this time, the Romans were actually in charge over all of Israel. And, and the Romans, as you know, they had Caesar sitting on the throne as emperor. And so Herod was kind of this, this middle, middle manager type of deal that he was in charge of the Jews, in charge of the people. And so the Magi come to see Herod, this middle manager. And of course they call him king, but they're like, hey, why aren't you guys worshiping the Christ? Why aren't you worshiping this baby, the, the Savior, the, the Messiah that's been prophesied? We even know about him. And, and Herod's like, wait, where is this baby supposed to be born? Where is this king supposed to be born? And the Magi are the one that tell Herod, don't you know? Micah chapter 5 verse 2. That's where you'll find this prophecy of the Savior being born in Bethlehem. And these foreigners are telling this Jewish guy where his king was going to be born. And so Herod does what Herod does. And he says, hey, go find him. Go find this king. Go find the king of the Jews. Oh, even though I'm the king of the Jews right now, you go find the king of the Jews so I can go and I can worship him. I can bow down before him. Imagine like, all right, that's great. Point us to the direction of Bethlehem. And so Herod's like, go that way, you know, take a left and go right and, and just, you'll, you'll find it. And so these magi, they go down and they see the star rise. 
Again, this heavenly body rise and they, they see that it's hovering over the house of Mary and Joseph where baby Jesus is. And as soon as they approach the house and they see Mary and they see Jesus, their reaction is to fall down on their knees and they worship him. And as they worship him, they present Jesus, this baby, this child. And again, we don't know how old Jesus was when the Magi finally arrived to him, but he was probably around five or six. And they, they bowed down before him and they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And what's important about these gifts are these gifts are specific for a certain group of people. These gifts were so expensive. I mean, gold is still expensive, but Frankincense and myrrh were these expensive perfumes that they're only given to royalty. They're only given to kings and princes, queens and princesses. There's no way that a normal shepherd, a normal carpenter, a normal butcher would ever come into contact with frankincense and myrrh. They would never come into contact with gold. And so when Jesus is, is being brought all these gifts by these men, these men are on their feet, these foreign men. Imagine the scene, how crazy it would have, it would have been to be Mary and Joseph. They'll be like, oh, this is, this is ridiculous. Like these men, are, these foreigners are bowing down before our son, worshiping, worshiping him, calling him the king. And then God meets the Magi in a dream and send them back off to their land without contacting Herod. Because Herod wanted to kill Jesus. He, Herod was afraid that he was going to be usurped. He was going to be overthrown by this child. Because even these foreigners were saying this child has a birthright to the throne. And so if the for foreigners would say that Jesus had a birthright to the throne, then what would the actual Jews say about Jesus as well? And so Herod wanted so dearly, so desperately to kill Jesus. So that's a, a basic synopsis, a summary of what's going on. And I'm sure that there's even some of you that are listening to it and being like, yeah, I've heard this story so many times before. So what's the importance? What's the point of it? Why is it in the Bible? Why is, is it something that I should believe in? And again, there's two responses, one of the Magi and one of Herod. First and foremost, I, I, I want to bring up something regarding this text that at least for me, and again, the, the, the beauty about being a pastor is I get to study for sermons. I get to study this, and at least it's edifying for myself. So even if it doesn't bless you, it's blessing me right now because these men are from Babylon, from Persia. And, and mo in modern days, that's Iran. Um, for, for today. That's, that's, we have a friend um, who's, who's, he calls himself Persian and he's from I Iran. And, and so it's great to, to hang out with him, kind of hear his perspective on the Middle East and, and all those things. And, and I don't like to get too political. I don't like to, to talk about politics on the pulpit. And so I won't. But what I'm sure many of you know is that the Middle East isn't necessarily the safest place. And it, it hasn't always been the safest place. It hasn't been a place where people are hugging each other and loving each other, uh, especially when it comes to different nationalities coming into contact. Even now in the news, you hear a lot about Jerusalem. You hear not a lot about Israel and a lot of the tensions that are going on between Palestine and Israel. And you have to understand that this, these conflicts didn't just begin yesterday. They, they began lo a long time ago. And so as I think about that, and as I study that these guys were from this land, we also have to remember that Babylon, that Babylon was the country, it was the empire that took over Israel before the Romans did. They were the ones in the time of Daniel, uh, in the time of, the, uh, of other prophets, that they came in and they stole all the young men, they, 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 they ransacked the city, they did all these terrible things that this was a country that to is, from Israel's perspective, there was a lot of tension already. And yet, and yet, this is the key. And yet God chose to show these men Christ. To show these men Jesus. Even though there was so much bad blood between them and the Jews and the Israelites, between Persia and Jerusalem, that God still had so much grace to show these intelligent these wealthy, these powerful men, a vision of Christ, a, an image of, of him. And so as, as I studied more, I realized, wait, 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 then what does the star represent? 
Like, what is this idea of a star? Because that's so childish that a star would come down. Like, we even know today, stars are billions and billions of, of degree or, 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 or of size-wise. They're, they're, they're way bigger than the earth, and they're super hot. And so if a star rested on top of Jesus' house, the whole earth would be destroyed. And so that doesn't make sense at all. And how could they see that from so far away? And why wouldn't everyone else in the region talk about a star? Why does it seem like the star sets and rises? And there's all these questions regarding that. And so there's an easy explanation when you understand what the original audience heard when they heard that there was a star residing over Christ. Is that it's an angel. It's a spirit. And, and, and what it means is, these guys were studying the heavenly bodies and God revealed to them his angel. God revealed to them an angel that when they were studying all the different stars, they saw another light and they were like, that's so interesting. It's not acting like these stars that are, that are so far away. It's acting like a light that's close and nearby, which led them to study. And I think the closest correlation to our world today is when we hear about people in Muslim countries, in Islamic countries, having dreams and visions of Jesus. And I don't know if you've heard about it, and if you haven't, I would love to share more with you. But there are lots of people now, like even currently, that are in these Islamic countries that have visions of Christ. And they risk their lives to follow Jesus, to learn more about him. We had someone come to our seminary and talk about specifically this topic. And they talked about how these people would have these dreams of Jesus and they would meet with him and they would wake up and they would say, I need to find out more about Christ. I need to find out more about Jesus. But because they're in a community that is so oppressive against Christianity that even if they bring up the name of Jesus, they would be killed. They would be, you know, they would be hung or they would be decapitated and so that they would be afraid of talking about Jesus. And so again, this is why we're so thankful that we live in a country where if you ask someone about Jesus, they're not going to kill you. They may look at you funny, but they, they, they're not going to kill you. That there are these people that are in these places that God sends a vision, a dream to them to understand who Christ is. And then it's their responsibility to go and find out more, to go get connected with other Christians and, and learn about this Jesus. So very similarly with these magi, they get this vision, and it's to a foreign land, to a place far away, and they go. And, and their, their, their reaction to Christ, to the birth of the king, to the savior of the world, is the first response that I want us to learn about today. And that response is that they fall on their knees and they worship Jesus as the king. This child, they, they, they bow down before him and they worship him. And what do they do in conjunction with their worship? They give him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These incredibly valuable, expensive gifts. And they say, Lord, it is yours. It is for you. To all honor and praise goes to you. And mind you, this is the Savior that they believe is for the Jews, the King of the Jews. And yet they show him that much respect. They worship him because their faith is genuine. They believe that this is, this is the king. This is the savior. They believe that. And so their response is of genuine faith. Their response is worship. It's generosity. They give these expensive gifts to Christ. And it's all for you. Their Christmas is great. Their Christmas is one in which they're not focused about other people. They're not focused on, on all the different materialistic things that are going on. Their focus is on, no, I want to give it all to the Lord because he is the savior of the world. He's the king. And on the flip side, and I think perhaps even more pertinent for our day and age, the second response, the antithesis, for, the ant ant antithetical response is the one of King Herod. And perhaps this is what I want to focus on a little bit more today. And, and I, I don't like to make it super awkward in here. But I think there's a lot of us in here, myself included, that have the heart of Herod. 
rather than the Magi. See, these Magi, when they come and they see Christ, they, they worship him with an unashamed worship, a worship that they're prepared to give him gifts. I mean, they brought these gifts from their far land and they gave it to him. Um, but Herod's response, I think, is far closer to my response, especially in the season of Christmas. See, Herod's response, or Herod's background, per se, let's say this. Herod, again, is kind of like this middle manager. He's not super powerful, but he's relatively wealthy. Let's call him upper class, like upper middle class. You know, he's not the emperor. He's not Caesar. He's not even the Praetorian guard that's, that's watching over all of Israel. He's kind of like the mayor of Israel, the mayor of Jerusalem, per se. And these wise men come, explain that, that they see this star, the king has been born, and Herod begins to think, as many of us do. Okay, you go and you find this king. You find this, this Lord, you find the Savior of the world, and you report back to me when you find him. Because when you find him and you worship and do all those things, bring him back to me so that I can worship him, so I can praise him. I want to meet this Jesus. I want to meet this child, and I want to experience him. But what we know about Herod's heart is in the back of his mind what he's thinking. And this is really where I, I want us to understand. Herod was thinking this. I'm the king of the Jews. And I don't even have that much power, but I need to maintain and hold on to my power and my kingdom as much as I can. And if these stupid foreigners come into my land and explain that there's this kid that's been born that is deserving of my job, you better believe I'm going to protect my job. I'm going to protect my kingdom. I'm going to protect my people. Because who's this snot-nosed kid that thinks he can grow up and take over my throne? Who can take over my kingdom? And so, yeah, I'll tell them I'm going to worship this Jesus. But really, Herod's heart was to kill Jesus. To get rid of Jesus. See, when we follow Jesus, this is the hard thing about being a Christian. When you follow Jesus, you're called to get... Bear your cross daily. You're called to die to yourself. You're called to give up everything. And it, it, it's not just compartmentalized things. When you're called to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, you're called to let go of everything you have and follow Jesus. Because he is the savior of the world. And the hope is, when we hear that, when we hear that, we wouldn't be saddened. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be depressed. Oh, I lose everything. I lose my life. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be poor and destitute. No, the hope is that our response would be like the Magi. See, when the Magi saw the vision of Christ, they saw this angel, this star in the sky, and they read the text and they said, yeah, this is the, the, the Messiah that has been promised. They were willing to give up incredibly expensive gifts. They were willing to give up their time, their effort, travel hundreds of miles, and their, and their offering was good. It was costly. It was meant for royalty. That's what the response is supposed to be when we're called to take up our cross daily, to give everything we have for him. It's not this, oh, I'm so sad I have to give up all this. It's this, of course, it's Jesus. Of course I'm going to give everything to Jesus. He's the king. He's the savior of the world. I'll give him everything I have. My whole being. My whole heart. And those are the guys that when they see Jesus, they're able to, to hold baby Jesus, to hug Jesus, to kiss him, to, to embrace him, to experience him because they understand that true faith and, and, and giving and sacrifice aren't really sacrifice at all. It's just worship unto a living and active God. The problem is that many of us are like Herod. When we hear about the birth of a Savior, the coming of the Lord, we think, oh, that's great. Let me worship him. I'll come to church on Sunday. I'll worship him, and I'll sing these songs unto him. We're going to sing all these praises unto Jesus. La-di-da-di-da. -di -da -di -da. 
But in our hearts, what we're thinking is this. But he better watch himself. Jesus better watch himself. Because if he thinks that he can take over my life, you're wrong. I'll, I'll say that I'm going to worship you, Jesus, but the day and moment you think that you can usurp my power, that you can sit on my throne, you're wrong. Jesus, stay in your place. Jesus, watch yourself. Jesus, be careful because I am not giving up my throne. And in the end of the day, the heart, that may be your heart and my heart, is it would be better if Jesus was dead. It would be better if Jesus was never born. It would be better if he didn't exist. See, Herod was a Jew, so he should have been the first in line to worship the coming king. He should have been the first person at the door of Mary and Joseph saying, here is my gold, here is my crown, here is my robe, and he should have wrapped Jesus up and said, this is the Savior. I am not the king. This, this child is the king. And how beautiful would it have been if Herod did that? How wonderful and how we would have, we would have called Herod name, Herod's name great if he did that. If Herod gave up his kingdom unto Christ, we would be talking about Herod in a very different light today. We would be saying, man, Herod, what a great guy. He, he worshiped Jesus and gave Jesus everything that now we would remember Herod as this amazing king beneath and submissive to Christ. But no, Herod's attitude is like my attitude. Yeah, I'll follow you, Jesus. I want to worship you with my mouth, but I'm going to protect my stuff. I'm going to protect my kingdom. I'm going to protect what I have. And really, I just wish you didn't exist. My faith, it's a burden. My, my belief in Yahweh, in God, is holding me back. It's not letting me be as successful as I need to be. My adherence to scripture, my adherence to the laws, there's no joy in that. I'm just withering away. Herod's response to the coming of Christ was selfish. It was about him, what he wanted. Which I find so ironic in our day and age with Christmas, how we constantly are thinking about what our needs are, what we want, what we desire what we can write on our wish lists. And again, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. All I'm trying to say is that there are two responses to the coming of Christ. The response of selfishness is definitely one of them. Saying, I hate coming to church and sacrificing my time and my energy. I hate serving because it's so, it's so burdensome. It's so weary. I hate giving. Oh, like why do I have to tithe? Like why do I have to give offering? It's such a responsibility. Man, Jesus, I wish you didn't exist so I didn't have to give up anything because look at these other people in the world. They're getting further and farther ahead than me because I have to give up so much for you. What a burden. Jesus, you're just an annoyance. You're a nuisance unto my life. Or there's the other aspect, the other response to Christmas, to the coming of Christ, which is as you witness Jesus, as you meet Jesus, that it wouldn't be a burden to give to him. It wouldn't be a burden to, to lavish him in amazing gifts but it would be your act of worship. It would be from the bottom of your heart. And again, this is, please, don't, don't ever let you think that this is me trying to tell you to give more to the church. If you're led to give to any other organization, any other place, if you're called just to buy someone lunch because God is putting that on your heart, go and do it. This is not me trying to tell you to give more offering. This is me explaining to you that when we serve the people around us, when we clothe them, when we feed them, when we look after the poor, the weak, and the weary, we're doing it not unto men, we're doing it unto Christ, the Savior of the world. And so I'm calling you to be generous this Christmas season, not unto men, but unto your Savior. Don't hold so tightly unto your kingdom, thinking that you have it in your control, that you're able to do it, because that's what Herod thought. And look what happened to Herod. 
His kingdom is long and gone. In many ways, it's just forgotten. And all that's remembered is how corrupt it was. I'm calling you to partner with Christ, to worship Christ, to bow down on your knees before him. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for this, this season. Lord, would you make us more like these magi, these people who are from a foreign land, who are immigrants, who have come a long distance to worship you. I pray that our heart in response to the coming of Jesus would be a generous one, not unto people, not unto man or organizations or, or groups, but it would be in a generous heart unto you, Lord, that we would lavish you with the gifts that you deserve. Father, you deserve gold, you deserve frankincense, you deserve myrrh, and we know these are costly gifts. And so, Father, we want to open up our hearts to you because you are the Savior of the world. Father, I pray that we would not have the heart of Herod. God, that we wouldn't look at Jesus and say with our mouth that we're going to worship you and in our hearts that we desire to kill you. Father, I pray that we would be more and more like Jesus. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us so much to be thankful for. Father, I pray that in this Advent season, that as we are in expectation of your second coming, Lord, would you give us the heart of these magi. God, these people who are willing to travel a far distance for you, at great cost for you, proclaiming that you are the king. Father, I pray that we would not forget this heart. We would not forget our faith in you. That we would be willing to give up all that we have unto you because you are the king. You are the savior of this world. Father, I pray that we would let go of our kingdoms. We would forsake our own lives. Lord, because you are worthy of ours. You are worthy of all that we have. Father, I pray you would help this to be real to us. Would you allow our, the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, to bring us a clarity about who you are, that we would encounter you. Father, that you would send visions and dreams to us, that we would know that you are the Christ, that you are Lord, that you are Messiah. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.